Torah Chizik is an organization which Baruch Hashem has been in existence for over 10 years uh, and we've had the schus, the merit to be able to have brought out Talmidei uh, Chachomim Rabonim of repute, public speakers with a tremendous amount of knowledge and ability to communicate. Rabbi David Ordman has uh, been a guest of Torah Chizik on numerous occasions and it is an honor and a pleasure to have him here with us this evening. I want to just tell you a little bit about him. Um, Rabbi David, Rabbi Ordman comes from a very illustrious family. Uh, he, before I started, already told me that I mustn't give too many shvachas, but it's important, I think, to understand who the man is and a little bit of his background. Uh, his father is a very choshevarov in England. He's the Rosh Yeshiva of Eitz Chaim Yeshiva. Uh, Rabbi Ordman uh, has married in also to a very choshev family connected to Chinuch Atzmoi in Israel. And in his, in his own right, is someone that has achieved much. He is the director of the Naseh Venishma program in Tel Aviv, which is part of a wider unit of Torah Be'emunah in, in Israel, which is a big unit that operates throughout the country, does seminars and kiruv programs on a massive scale. He also spent two very productive years in Australia, where uh, he went out on behalf of uh, Torah Vermuna and also the Lakewood Cradle in Melbourne and uh, managed there to be Mavit Torah, to spread Torah thought on a massive scale. Apparently he tells me they had over 14 seminars there and the whole movement has been started with a follow-up situation and uh, they brought out somebody especially from America to take over and it has been a very successful venture. Uh, it is our intention, hopefully, that in the near future we will also have seminars here. And therefore, I request everybody, uh, please, to... There, there will be going around a, a pad, and we ask you, please, everybody, to put down your names and addresses so that you can be on our mailing list so that we can inform you when these seminars and our general other Torah activities take place. Before I call upon Rabbi Oldman to address you, uh, I would like to thank Rabbi Bender for making the hall available. Uh, always in the past, whenever Torah Chizik has had functions, he has been tremendously cooperative, and we thank the Yehovah Shul uh, for their activities and their uh, hospitality. Um, thank you. That short introduction, it gives me great pleasure to call upon Rabbi Oldman to address you. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me to be back here again. The last time I came to South Africa was five years ago. And, and I must really tell you, I've, I've missed not being able to visit you here in Johannesburg. Thank you, Rabbi Shane, and to the Yeovil Schultz for being, being able to, to give this talk here tonight. And because it is a talk on a topic which usually takes something like between now and 3.30 in the morning to get through, I don't think I'll waste any more time and uh, get right into the topic. I know that many of you have heard watched or have seen me when I did the seminar here some five, in 1984, six years ago. <coughs> Many of you have watched uh, the videos of that seminar and you're aware of an area of research called equidistant sequences of letters in the Torah. Um, I'm sure that there are some people over here who aren't aware of this subject, and therefore I'll give a very brief overview of where did this work begin, how it began, and where it developed into, and then we'll get into this 
topic which is uh, very fresh. It's only been uh, a year or two old of research being done in Jerusalem on the uh, equidistant sequence program in the Torah. The original discovery that there does seem to be a certain type of coding in the Torah, that the letters in the Torah are not there at random just to give a message through words and sentences, but there does seem to be an underlying um, coding or signaling through the Torah was a discovery made by a Hungarian rabbi, Rabbi Michael Ber Weissmandel, during the Second World War. He had a phenomenal mind. And to the best of my knowledge, there was a time when this Rabbi Weissmandel, who was in then, at that time, he was running away from the Nazis, and in many he was negotiating with them the famous blood for lawyers aborted deal with Adolf Eichmann, Yemach Shemai. Rabbi Weissmandel found himself for some short time in a bunker with one safer in his hands, and that was the Tanakh. He had a Tanakh. And his son told me that he had pieces of paper and with a pencil he wrote, he made a few observations. I think to him those observations were just interesting, what we might have called today as parparaot shel chokhmah, something in the word, in the same as... Uh, relating or equating it with gematrias and things like that. But I don't think that he realized that he had over there, he had in fact uncovered a level of seeing Torah in a way which was going to give a message to thousands of Jews, whether here or in Israel, more in Israel than anywhere else, and through our programs in Australia, to see a new dimension and an understanding of what this Torah, these five books of Moshe, what we call divinely, we say divinely revealed by HaKadosh Baruch Hu to Am Yisrael, was, was really there. The discovery he made is this famous menorah effect, which I ask those who have seen all this before, bear with me for about 10-15 minutes while I go through a few ideas which people have not seen. He made this Manoa effect Get it? <coughs> he made an observation that the word Torah as a word appears at an equidistant jump from the beginning of Sefer Bereshis. If you have a look at Sefer Bereshis, you'll find the top of the word Bereshis. This is chapter 1 of the book of Genesis, the first verse. He counted 49 letters, and he found a vav on the 50th letter. 49 letters from there, a resh. 49 letters from there, a hay. The word Torah appears at an equidistant jump. Whether it had any meaning or not, we didn't, uh, it didn't interest him. He just said he found it. It did interest a certain gentleman from the Technion in Haifa, Professor of Mathematics, Daniel Michelson, who lectured also at Yale University and at Harvard University, on a paper that he wrote on this topic. A person, he, he himself, a skeptic, he himself, he described himself once as an anti-religious Jew, but seeing this information, he wanted to try and work out whether the information is of significance whether it shows design, or is it just random coincidence? And he writes these words in his paper. Let us mention that on a statistical basis, 
The word Torah is expected to appear with any given interval n in Genesis about two or three times. This estimate is based on the total number of letters in the book of Genesis, which is 78,064. The, the amount of letters tof, there are 4,152 tofs in the book of Genesis, 8,448 vovs, 4,793 ratios, and 6,283 hays. On that basis, one can work out quantitatively how many times any number, if let us say, would the word Torah appear anywhere in the book of Genesis at any equidistant jump, at let's say a jump of 249? The answer is, it should appear anywhere or somewhere between two or three times. If you want it to jump at 1,683, it again should appear two or three times. Indeed, the word Torah does appear three times in the whole of the book of Genesis at the interval 50. In other words, not the interval 50, I call it 49, the 50th letter. Which is what can reasonably be expected from any book of such length and of similar concentration of the letters Tov, Vav, Resh, and Ahay. There is, however, no reason why one of these three appearances should start with the very first Tov of the book. Remember, there are 4,152 Tovs in the book of Bereshis. And he says there is no reason why the very first of the three appearances should that appearance be the very first top? And why this should happen both in Genesis and, as we will see, the same thing happens in the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, which is Shmos, we find top, the very first top, 49 from there is a Bob, 49 from there is a Reish, 49 from there is a Hay. Again, from the very first top. As a matter of fact, the, prob the probability of such a coincidence we have worked out is to be one in three million. Now, the moment you come to numbers like this, he explains that one in three million to a layman, and I'm a layman, and I'm not a have no great under great understanding in the world of statistics. I understand that it means one in three million. In other words, you would have to write another three million random texts for this to appear once more, at a, roughly. Now, three million random texts is a lot of paperwork, showing, of course, he wants to see over here, that this convinced him that we do seem to find over here design, an underlying design of an equidistant lettering in the tone. Then he found, this is Rabbi Weissmandel's work, going further on, as we see, you find the word Torah over here, Torah in the book of Genesis. We find the word Torah again in the book of Numbers, where the word Torah appears backwards at a jump of 49. And you will find in the book of Deuteronomy again the, the jump. But interestingly enough, there are two differences which have extremely interesting philosophical, there are philosophical reasons, objective philosophical reasons, why... In the book of Deuteronomy, the word Torah appears in the fifth verse. And why the jump is not 49, but is in fact 48. I'm not going to go into it this evening, because if we do, if we're going to try and explain the significance and reasons for every, uh, everything we're going to see here tonight, we'll be here really till 3.30 in the morning. So, just as a beginning, what we are seeing over here, this discovery was made by Rabbi Weissmandel. I don't think he himself realized what he had discovered and what a message it would be giving to the scientific community or to people who are scientifically orientated to, to see this type of map. In fact, this type of map posed an interesting question to those Bible critics who claimed that the book of Deuteronomy, the books, the five books of Moses, <coughs> um, are in fact random books written at different times, by different people, different styles. The famous documentary theory of uh, Wellhausen. 
and showing that the toa is not uniform. In fact, here we find an underlying mapping over here, a coding, a signaling that does seem to show a certain uniformity running right across the books of the five books of Moses. Now, this information, after we had, uh, we went through ideas of jumps of seven of words in different areas, one of the most startling uh, uh, bits of information was, again, a very interesting um, observation by Rabbi Weissmandel, and that was, again, based on Jewish philosophy. In Jewish thought, we know that, as the Midrash tells us, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu histakel ba'olamo upara alma, histakel ba'torah upara alma. We know from a philosophical point of view that the Torah itself is a blueprint of the whole of creation. And being a blueprint of the whole of creation means that everything that we find in creation must be in the blueprint. And uh, in fact, uh, this was a question which was posed to uh, the Ramban, the famous Nachmanides, concerning, concerning his great mentor Maimonides, where does Maimonides, if everybody and everything in the world of creation is coded somewhere in this vast five books of Moses, and therefore that's whole creation of 5,700 odd years of creation, we have everything and everyone and every event somewhere in the Torah. The question was asked about where was the Rambam mentioned in the Torah? And in fact, it was the Ramban who answered Nachmanides, who said that he does, he does appear. He appears in the Torah once as an acronym. The acronym being the words Lema'an, Revot, Moftai, Be'eret, Mitzrayim. Revot, Moftai, Be'eret, Mitzrayim. The first letters are Reish, Mem, Base, and a Mem. This is not an equidistant jump. The words are different lengths, but just as an acronym, and this was objectively said by the Ramban, by Nachmanides, to one of his Talmudim, to one of his disciples. And interestingly enough, Rabbi Weissmandel seemed to add in another little bit of information, and that information to Professor Danny Mittelson was in fact astounding, and it made him shake in his knees. And that is that Rabbi Weissmandel tells us that not only does Maimonides' name appear in the Torah, but in fact that great monumental work which he wrote on which the whole of today's code of Jewish law is basically based, his famous work Mishnah Torah, is also coded into the Torah. And to show it to you over here, first of all let me remind you that the Ramban, the Rambam wrote this monumental work of Mishnah Torah, a very short, concise, halachic codex on every single one of the 613 mitzvot which is in the Torah. Rabbi Weissmandel makes this observation. If you see over here, these are the words, the letters which, my, which Nachmanides relates to. Vayom Hashem el Moshe. Lo yishma aleichem paro, paro will not listen to you. This is the book of uh, Exodus, the, uh, it's chapter uh, 11, verse 9, if I'm not mistaken, yes, if that's verse 10, that's verse 9. Lema'an revot, reish, mem, base, mem, is the letters of the Rambam. Comes along Rabbi Weissmandel and says, interestingly enough, the Rambam's first name was Moshe, Moshe ben Maimon. This Moshe over here from the Mem, you will find 49 letters from there is a Shin, 49 letters from there is a Nun, 49 letters from there is a Hay. The word Mishnah appears. And if you go to the bottom of that text, you will find a Tov, 
49 letters from there is a vav, 49 letters from there is a resh, 49 letters from there is a hay. So in this text you have Mishnah Torah. Now to those of you who don't know, have never seen this slide before, most of you most probably have, you'll ask the question, what about this distance over here in between? Well, if you start counting from this very top mem, 613 letters you come to a tov, from the shin, 613 letters, you have a vav. From the mem, to, uh, mishnah, from the nun, 613 letters, you come to the resh. And from the hay, 613 letters, you come to a hay. The 613, that number about the, what the mitzvahs were all about. Now again, I'm not looking over here for significance. The question over here is, and this was a question which Professor Michelson asks himself, as a cold-blooded scientist and a skeptic. Is this random chance? Is this mere coincidence? Or does this show design? I see some people writing over here, if they want to look at anything, I'll leave it over here for a second. Let me read to you the words which Professor Mittelson does mention concerning the Rambam. If you still wish to know the probability, oh yes, by the way, he did a he did a computer test right through the five books of Moses to find out a whether there is another acronym of the Rambam's name anywhere in the Torah. His answer was no. This is the only one. It doesn't appear again in the Torah. He asked himself again: Does this pattern over here appear anywhere else? anywhere else in the whole of the five books of Moses? His answer was negative. Now he had to know what was the chance that such a thing, what the probability that this is random, mere coincidence, and not design. He said, if you still wish to know the probability, the likelihood of such a Mishnah Torah, starting with a given M, Mems, or M is one in 186 million. That is the chance that the pattern you have seen over here, mathematically, checked right through the whole of the book of, the whole of the five books of Moses, is one in 186 million. So, our good friend, Professor Middleson, landed himself with a problem. Here he was, asking himself a question. You might find codes in the Torah, you might find the word Torah, you might find words which seem to have a link with a text in which you find it. The whole question he asks over here is this. We all know that, e we know, we believe that the Torah was given to us 2,449 years ago. The Torah was written by Moshe Rabbeinu during a period by during a period of 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. We know that this was not divine inspiration, but in fact this was divine dictation. We know that within the, that the end of the 40 years of the wandering in the wilderness, Moshe Rabbeinu wrote 13 Sifrei Torah. The Torah was completed on the day of his death. Yet we have our skeptics, we have our Bible critics who claim that the Torah was not written. It was written at a much later date time of maybe Ezra and Nehemiah, it was completed then, written over a thousand years later. But at least one thing, we all come, I think, to the, uh, uh, there is a general consensus that the Torah must have been completed at least 2,432 years ago. On that I don't think there is any argument. For the simple reason that 2,432 years ago, Ptolemy Philadelphus had the Torah translated into Greek, the famous Septuagint, the 70 sages, translated the Torah into Greek, of which one copy you can find, it's a long distance from here, in a museum in Basel, in Switzerland. And I think we all agree that it's very difficult to write, to translate a book which hasn't yet been written. So we assume that the Torah must have been written by then. Now, the Rambam only lived 850 years ago. And therefore, Professor Michelson over here was landed with a problem 
that it seems that if this was designed, somebody, some 1500 years prior to the birth of the Rambam, knew about something that was going to happen some, fifth, some 1100 years later. That poses already a philosophical problem. But the problems accentuated themselves as time went on because Professor Mickelson was interested in developing into more research. And from there he went on into a topic, a, uh, an issue which was uh, again an observation made by a certain gentleman in Israel and since then has been described as what they call the Aharon Code. Now it's very important for me to show you this code, although I believe I have shown it to some of you at a second talk I gave during, um, during a, a visit to uh, Israel, uh, to Johannesburg after the last seminar. And Professor Mickelson starts off dealing with this code in this way. Now he looks at it from a purely statistical point of view, so let's, let's have a little bit of entertainment. We don't have to have it such a serious evening. And over here, ladies and gentlemen, you have over here a wonderful series of numbers. And you wouldn't believe it. If anybody wants to know what this series of numbers is, it is a series of numbers taken randomly out of the yellow pages of the Jerusalem telephone book. Here it is, but we've taken out the names. The names and something that we're going to notice over here, which is rather unusual. Here you have two columns of one page. Two columns of one page of the yellow pages of the Jerusalem telephone book. And he says, leaving out area codes, forgetting about area codes, normally telephone numbers are pretty random. I don't know what it's like over here. But in Israel, they are random. <coughs> For that reason, when I phone up my parents, I usually get the chemist. <laughs> and that's your random answers too. But this is a telephone. Uh, this is a, a list of telephone numbers. Now, when numbers are random, he says, double numbers should also be random. It's been worked out statistically. He is a world-famous statistician, Professor Michelson. Yet, he says, when we have a look we find that the two columns over here do not seem to uh, be in par with one another. One would have expected, taking the number of numbers you have in one column, the expected series of double numbers like 22s, two 33s, two, three threes, one one, zero zeros, should be roughly 25, between 25 and 30 numbers on any of these two columns, yet, if you have a look, you'll find over here that there is roughly on the first column some 25 or 30, I'm not sure exactly, yet you're going to find over here a tremendous concentration of double numbers. You've got 2 2, 2 2, 5 5, 5 5, 2 2, 1 1 1, 2 2 2, 1 1 2, etc. Et you can read them, there's your numbers. And therefore he asked himself a question, is this random coincidence or design? Now the answer was that he, he obviously worked it out statistically that there are over a hundred uh, examples over here that there must have been over here some type of design because there seems to be a deviation from what the expected, mean, ex expected appearance of numbers should be. And you find over here, now if I ask you, what do you think that numbers like this, 2 2, 2 1, 1 1, 2, 2, 5, 5, 5, 5, 2, 2, 2, 1, 1, 2. By the way, two, the 2 over here is not an area code number. The area code of Jerusalem is 02. But the, this is not an area code number. And the answer is that there does seem to be, for some reason or other, and everybody knows, most probably you have this over here in, in Johannesburg, there are certain telephone numbers which are given to certain companies or organizations in order that people should remember. Obviously, I think your, the police is 999 or 000, easy numbers to remember if somebody needs it. What would one expect to find over here with such a concentration of numbers? Well, if any, well, people ask, they might say to hospital numbers or something like that. Well, in fact, these are taxi rank numbers in Jerusalem. So, when you see over here, here is now the whole page 
of the yellow pages of the telephone book in Jerusalem, here you will find that in fact all these companies, from down all the way down to about here, in fact are taxi cab numbers, showing design, reason that it's there, it was given there with a special reason to make it easy for people to remember telephone numbers. So if anybody intends going to Israel next week for Rosh Hashanah, and you're looking for a taxi, quickly, here are some numbers you can take down straight away. It was on this basis he researched a he researched something which was extremely interesting, and that was what they called the Iron Code. I'm not getting used to this. The Iron Code over here was a discovery made by Avraham Orin from Kibbutz Ste Eliyahu, met some years ago. He did a test on the first 13 verses of the book of, Gen of, the book of um, Numbers, uh, Leviticus, sorry, the book of Ayikra. And without going into any other philosophy why, he finds that the name Aharon appears in this text at an equidistant jump of different numbers, such as 18, 62, or going backwards, we'll minus 87. <coughs> Over here you've got plus 9, so let's count 9, just to show you one example. Aleph, Hay, Reish, Nun, nine letters. We are not trying to look at this, at this stage at the significance of the numbers, why? But what we do see over here is a picture of 25 jumps within that 715 letters of that text. We find Aharon's name appearing there 25 times. Over here, again, a cold-blooded scientist wants to see whether this is a random picture or not. He wants to know, is this random or not? So what does he do? He makes his first test by having a look and trying to discover how many Alephs are there in the text, how many Hays there are in the text, how many Rashes there are in the text, and how many Nuns. He had that worked out, worked it across 715 letters that there are in the text, that do appear in the text, and finds that one should expect to see no more than eight Aharons there. In other words, understand me, ladies and gentlemen, that wherever you have any text, in any language, words should appear at jumps. But it doesn't mean that there is any significance. This is, it, it will be pure coincidence if it is within the realms of the probability, the numbers of letters, the data you have in front of you, the number of letters, the word that you're looking for, the uh, frequency of the letters in that text, words should appear. So if eight arrows would appear over here, it would have had no, I'm not saying philosophical significance, but certainly as far as st uh, statistical uh, uh, significance, it would have had none. But in fact, what do we find? We find the number 25, which is a deviation by some almost 300%. Now he wanted to investigate why. Could it be that the number of letters that do appear in the text seem to be to give over a message which is more than just one hour, more than 25 hours. So what did he do? He took the text and did the following test. That following test was this. As you will see, you can read it all in English. Take all possible combinations of Aharon. There are 24 combinations, but forward and backwards count as one. Search for the number of appearances of each word. The meaningless letter combination Ahanar appears eight times, as does Aharan. In fact, what did he do? He just jumbled up the word Aharon using the same letters and threw them into the computer. How many times these letters appear as words? Words, some of them obviously meaningless. Uh, in the text, using the same letters, the same number of the same number, 715 letters, the same text, and the same word. And what do we find? 
Aleph Hay Nun Reish appears. Eight, Aleph Reish Hay Nun. Eight, nine, seven, five, six, six, five, six, six, nine, eleven. You have over here a beautiful average of eight, and that's exactly what should have appeared. Yet, Aharon appears over here 25 times. Here he is, all the way up, 25 times. So he still had the question, why does it appear as such? So he did the next test. The next test was by placing into the computer, if you want to know how many letters, I'll tell you. 117,128 words were checked on the computer. By the way, the chances that 25 Aharon should appear in the text was worked out to be one in a million. It was a one in a million chance. What did they do now? The computer was programmed to search for all possible four letter combinations of the Hebrew alphabet. Aharon has four letters. It's a four lettered, a word of four letters in the Torah, in the Hebrew language. We will take now every combination of all the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So you've got 22 times 22 times 22 times 22, which is 234,256 words. In other words, just to give you an example, the first word will be what? Aleph, 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 Aleph. The next word will be Aleph, 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 Base. Aleph, 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 Gimel. Aleph, 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 Dalek. They're meaningless words. But they are combinations of all the letters of the Hebrew, of the, of the, um, of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, since we're working with backwards and forwards appearances, we don't have to check all 234,256. All you have to check is half that number, because you're going backwards and forwards anyway. So all you only have to check is 117,128. So they checked all combinations. And the same, obviously, Aleph Hay Reish Nun is one of those, once you reach it, somewhere along the line, is going to be one of those 117,128 letters. And now they built up a, a map. These are all the words, the four lettered combinations, which appeared in the text with a deviation from the mean expected appearance to the tune of one to a thousand. That's all. In other words, any word which appears over here should not have appeared in that text. The chances it should appear at there at random is over one in a thousand. Yet, you will find that out of all these, I think there are about four words over here which have any meaning. I think the word otcha is there. Here you've got yithap, yitan. It has, they are not Hebrew words. Yet, their expected appearance over there is less than a thousand, one in a thousand. Yet if you have a look at there, here is the probability number. There is one word with four letters, the only one out of 117,128 combinations of Aharon, of the Hebrew alphabet, which appeared with a expect well, with a probability of over one in a million. The only one was Aharon. There it is, 0.00000194. Yet all the others do not show anything near one in a million. Now that really made his knees shake. He still wanted to know why is Aharon appearing there. He carried on from there, and he went into. He said, you know what, I'm going to have to check another text. What I'll do is, it seems that we'll have to check a text which is very similar to that, very similar to that of Vayikra. Over here, I'm sorry some of the letters got rubbed out. Over here we find the text as we have it in the Torah, Vayikra, what we call the Masoretic text. Over here, you have a very similar text, and this is what you call the text of the Samaritans. It's the Samaritan Torah, the Samaritan Bible. I like that word used, Torah, for it. The Samaritan Bible also has it, and they also have it in Hebrew. Yet there are slight deviations, what 
that they deviate from the way we write words, and all the larger ones is where we find the deviation. The word alehem over here we have without a yud, they have a yud there. Korbanchem, they write it korbanechem. Liutsono, we have one vol, they have two. You have a few deviations, sorry, oh, sorry. <laughs> added letters. Reminds me of the fact that my Rosh Hashiva once engaged in Yeshiva was so immersed in his studies after giving a shear, walked out of the Yeshiva and he was just thinking about that shear that he was giving and literally walked into a lamppost and he said, excuse me, sorry, and walked on. <laughs> we have over here these two differences. You said, know what? There's a slight deviation over here of letters. We'll put the word Aharon over here, and we'll see what happens. And what happened was, out of the 25 Aharons that appeared in this text, 21 were wiped off completely. Only four were left, and another five were added. They ended up with nine, which was that mean expected appearance in the text. But that's just a slight difference, what they call it. Whatever it was, it meant to him that it seems that there does seem to be this appearance, appearance of words of Aharon in the text to be of significance. To him it meant also there is a definite signaling of the Torah through codes. The Torah is coded. Okay, we'll just leave out this final text or may perhaps uh, just, show, just to show how significant he found it to be, was this. You'll notice over here a whole set of numbers. It's a result of this test. He decided he was going to do another test. Instead of looking for our own at an equidistant jump, he will now look for our own at a non-equidistant jump. In other words, you will take an Aleph, you will take an Aleph, a He, a Resh, and a Nun. There you have it. Normally we have a, the letter N here, number, and you have a number at the equidistant. But then he asked the question, what would happen, what would happen if instead, in fact, instead of having an equidistant jump, we will have a non-equidistant jump, where you're going to have n, and here will be n plus x, another number, and here will be n plus y, where x and y are x equals plus or minus 5. y equals plus or minus 5. In other words, let's say Aaron could appear at 9, so this number, we'll accept any letter after the he, the resh, anything between 4 and 14. Because 9 minus 5 is 4, 9 plus 5 is 14. Any number we would find, we will, ex we will accept that resh. Again, we will accept a nun where y is plus or minus 5, and it does not have to be the same number as x. Would one expect to see more aharons in the text? A similar number of aharons in the text? or less numbers of arrows in the text? Well, obviously, one would expect to see more, because your scope is widened. If you have a look for an aharon, you find an aleph, and nine letters later you find a hay. You must find nine letters later a resh. If you haven't, these two are worthless. But if you find a resh scoping between 14 and 4, you've just widened your scope. You expect to see many more. In fact, one would have expected maybe to see 40 Aharons in the text. Have a look what happened over here. That when x and y, when y was minus 5 to 0 plus 5, and x was minus 5 to 0 plus 5, in fact, less Aharons appeared in the text. The largest number was 15. The lowest number was 5, uh, it was a 2, I think, somewhere even. Two, where y was 1 and x was minus 3, 
then in fact you only had two arrows in the whole text. Yet, when x and y were zero, in other words, it had become equidistant, n, in fact, you found the largest number, 25. That was the area which he was researching until another two researchers got involved. Their names, Doron Wittstum and Professor Eli Ribbs, one doctor of physics, the other professor of mathematics. And they entered into a new world. A world which I'm not going to deal, I'm not going to talk about the statistics of it, it's too difficult for me to almost sometimes to understand. But just let's see a direction. And if anybody has any questions about as far as statistics are concerned, we'll discuss this later on. First of all, I would like you to see this chart. So everything's done over there systematically. Over here we have a chart of the frequencies of letters in the books of Genesis. The most frequent letter in the book of Genesis, what would one expect to be? The most frequent letter. No. Vov. The Vov is the most frequent letter. Interestingly enough, the next one is Aleph of all the letters. Now, please remember, we'll have to just remember this number. Let's remember that there are 78,064 letters in the book of Genesis. And from now on, till the end of this evening's talk, we will only be talking about the book of Horatius. Now, in the book of Genesis, we have 78,064. The number of volves, 8,448. In other words, it's 10.8% of all the letters in the book of Genesis. I put circles around the letters which were least frequent. Gimel. There are only 577 gimels. There are only 577 gimels on the whole of the book of Genesis, which makes it seven-tenths of one percent of the whole of the letters. Zion, 428, which is 5.4 tenths of one percent. 308 tesses, 3.9 tenths of one percent. The least frequent of them, if I'm not mistaken, is the test. The test... The octet appears in Genesis the least frequent. Then you've got your summers, 446, five tenths of one percent. You've got kuf, tzadik, pays, and irons. They're also something like one percent, three percent, one point three percent, one point six percent, etc. It's quite important to understand this and to remember it because as we're going to come along words, words with seven, nine, ten, eleven letters then obviously the moment those letters don't contain just alephs and vovs and reishis, you're going to find over here that the, the possibilities for these words to appear at all are in fact very significant. We're now going to talk about, and this will be the area of which all the research has been done, and which of the book is out already on this topic. Unfortunately, it's still only in Hebrew, and I know that they're printing it in, in English, and Amir Sashem, once they've done that, then I'm out of business. You'll have everything in print. Here you're going to find this type of phenomena. I'm now talking about what we call the minimum equidistant sequence. Now, let me explain to you very simply once, and so you won't get mixed up uh, as we go, get, go along this evening. Any word, almost any word, we will find words that only appear once, but any word you could imagine. If I were, let's say, take the word shulchan, table. Shin vov lamad ches nun. Shulchan has four jumps. There are four spaces between the five letters. And I take this word and I'll put it into the computer and ask the computer, in the 78,064 letters of the book of Genesis... How many times does this word appear at any jump between, um, between Halep's five jumps, the maximum 78,000, is something in the region of about 15,000. Between 1 and 15,000, a jump of even 15,000. It will come up more than once. 
10, 15. The smaller the word, the more frequent the letters. It can turn up hundreds of times. Your printout is going to show you exactly where does it appear, at what jump does it appear, and the minimum equidistant jump is the narrowest jump that it appeared. In other words, the lowest number. Are you all with me? Any difficulties? I'll explain it again. Just in order for you to see how, um, how it originally appeared, here you have one example. And that is, over here you'll notice, the word, I'm not going into it, we haven't just any time, the word Eden, Eden, Gun Eden, Eden, appearing in the above text, the printout showed that it appeared 16 times at 85, 83, 16, 107, 58, 53, 105, and here are where they appeared. So this is the printout. The minimum jump is the lowest number, and in this case, if I'm not mistaken, was 16. The closest jump. That is what you call the minimum equidistant sequence in the book. Now look what happens. After many experiments, they find this interesting phenomenon. That the minimum jump of, let us say, the word Chagorot, Chagorot belt, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave to Adam and his wife Chava belts to wear after the chet, after the sin. Vayasulahem Chagorot. The word Chagorot was placed and asked to find where does it appear in the text. Anywhere in the whole of the book of Genesis, any number. For I write up to 78,064. Once they had the, the printout, they wanted to know where was the lowest number. The lowest number appeared at number 9, over here. Chet, Gimel, Reish, Tav. Now, is there, any, is there anything, something over there which awakens within us some significance? It seems that the minimum jump appeared very close to the word itself. Now, this word appears, as a word, appears in the book of Genesis once. And the minimum jump appeared right close to the text. Here are some, an, another few examples. Let's take the word Bacharu. Mikol Asher Bacharu. To choose. The minimum of this word appears over here. Bacharu. Going backwards, two letters. The word Kidmat Eden. The word kidmat appears once. The word appeared over here, kidmat, minimum minus eight, going backwards at eight letters. Now, this gave them the understanding that we're talking over here about something where it seems that the minimum equidistant jump seems to have significance. And they started working on that. They worked on that but they introduced a new element into their research. That element in their research is called two-dimensional reading. Now, two-dimensional reading is... If I have something I can wipe off here... Is there anything? No, okay, go. Hmm? Hmm? Two-dimensional reading is this. You take the Torah... And you write it as one stream of letters around a cylinder. Etc., <laughs> etc. As a stream of letters. So in other words, once you have a stream of letters, in fact what you have over here, any part of that cylinder you will have, if you cut up that cylinder, take out a section, what you're going to get is a stream of letters, stop, and a stream of letters underneath it. You will obviously realize then 
that when you have such a stream of letters, with no spaces in between words, you can now read the Torah from left to right, from right to left, vertically and diagonally. This is an area of research called two-dimensional reading. And they, this research was done, and they started to work on the statistical probabilities that words will appear in the text as such. Words which are linked to the text are also minimums. When I say minimums, in other words, it's their lowest appearance in the whole of the book of Genesis, all appearing in one area and having significance with one another. Let me just show you an example, and then we'll go into some more interesting ones. it was found. Where did it appear at its minimum number? They found that the lowest number that the word Hachanuka appears in the Torah, it appears once at a very low number. That low number happens to be 262 letters between one letter and the next. It's understandable. Hachanuka is seven letters. If you have, no, if you have, uh, sorry, six letters, you have five jumps. The nun already is not such a frequent letter, or, or the ches, or the chaf. And they found it at 262. Again, on the cylinder basis, they cut out the section on the cylinder where it appeared at 262 letters a line. What you're seeing over here is not 262 letters a line, because then I'd go off the slide. What they're showing you is the central section where Hanukkah appeared at a jump of 262 letters. Here it is, the skip is 262. And here the word ha ha nu ka appears. Now what is so astounding about this appearance is not that it appears over there, but let us take the concepts which Hanukkah reminds us of and find out where those words appear in the whole of Bereshis at its minimum equidistant jump. Let's have a look, let's say the word Makabi. Mi kamocha ba'elim Hashem. The slogan of the Hashmanaim. The word Makabi appears at a minimum jump over the whole of Sefer Bereshis here. Ma ka -bi at a minimum jump of one letter. And it slices right through the word Chanukah, the kaf of Chanukah is the same kaf as the word Makabi. These two concepts have zeroed in onto the very same text and the same line and the same letter, even though everybody will admit that the story of Chanukah could not have been predicted in the tone as a human prediction. The Maccabees were who? That was the slogan of which house? The house that went out to fight against, against the Greeks. The Hasmoneans. The Hasmoneans is Beit Hashmonai. Now the minimum, the minimum equidistant jump of the word Hashmonai appears here in the text. Chet, Shin, Mem, Vav, Nun, Aleph, Yud. The minimum of Hashmonai appears in the text over here. The dump jump is equal. Understand, if you're going in any straight line, whichever direction, as long as you're not going bending anywhere, you have a jump, an, an equidistant jump. In fact, the jump is going to be from the Ches to the Shin, 
twice 262 plus 1. Twice 262 plus 1, twice 262 plus 1. So you've got, in fact, that jump there. Now this seems to show tremendous significance. That it seems, it's like as he described, as uh, Doron explains, uh, describes, it's like a shot in the dark and hitting the target five times, one after the other, turning round, shooting in the dark, closing your eyes and hitting the same target. Obviously showing that it seems that the, the uh, information is zeroing in onto one section. Significance of the section? Well, you can have the Kabbalists who are looking for significance. He is not looking for significance at this point. They're trying to build a picture. Whether this pattern has any meaning, not philosophically, but statistically. Let me show you one. A very, it's one which has always moved me because of the, uh, not of the actual significance, but uh, the actual appearances of words over here. I must admit that in reading their scientific papers on this, I have in front of me over here a paper written to the Journal of the Royal, the Royal Statistical Society here, it's this thick, on all this topic, on this topic, and we'll see the results at the end of this talk. How objective these gentlemen were in their research. First of all, they decided which topics are we going to research for. So they decided, first of all, language, spelling, who will decide how to spell words. They will accept the jurisdiction of the, encyclop the Hebrew Encyclopedia, or the, uh, a, an encyclopedia of Gedoli Israel, of great uh, Jewish giants from uh, Harav Magulis. But in fact, they will not decide the spelling, they will not decide the topics. They decided to take topics which will take at least three columns, which receive at least three columns in the Hebrew, Encycli in the Hebrew Encyclopedia's uh, information. Any person who gets less than that information, they won't take his name. So in other words, arbitrarily not knowing who's going to be chosen, who's not going to be chosen, they receive a name who receives except a, uh, a, a, at least three columns of information. One of the people they decided to research was a very interesting man. They looked at the name as an experiment, the name of the person, Franz Josef. Everyone knows Franz Josef was the emperor of Austria, and uh, he was a very kind emperor to the Jewish people. He lived a long time. And they looked for the name Franz Josef, and they wanted to know where does he appear in the book of Genesis, um, at a minimum equidistant jump. And interestingly enough, what do they find? They find over here a verse in the Torah which says these words. And here, what you hear, you can see, the jump is 36 letters. And since it's 36 letters, and Bo Hashem, we have transparencies which can print 36 letters, you have the whole text there in front of you. Here we have the words of the book of Genesis at 36 letters. Let us read the words. Vayomer paro el Yosef. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Emor el achecha zot asu. Tell your brothers this is what you shall do. Ta'anu et be'irchem. Load up your flock, your sheep. Ulechu bo'u altsof knam and come and live in the land from Canaan. Vayikhu, vayikhu, ukhu et avichem imachem, and bring your father with you. You remember that is the story of Joseph after he had revealed the dreams, the seven years, the, uh, the, um, the, his uh, interpretation of Pharaoh's dreams, and he'd become a viceroy, and, the, and then the uh, accusation of his children, of his brothers as being spies. After his revelation to his brothers, Pharaoh said to Joseph, you can bring your parents, bring your family, live in 
live in, in Mitzrayim. Interestingly enough, it was Franz Josef, who in fact was one of the first emperors who gave freedom to the Jewish people to be able to live in, um, uh, in Austria. And what do we find? On the name Yosef, the pay of Yosef is not only the name Yosef, but a jump of 36 letters. We find the word Franz at a jump, and this is, interestingly enough, now we're not going to do the mathematics of it, it is not the absolute minimum over the whole of the book of Genesis. It is the minimum of 92% of the book of Genesis. 8%. It does not be a minimum in 8% of the book of Genesis. Yet, we'll soon see its mathematical significance. Franz Josef. And in that very same part of the text, you'll find the word, which is a minimum over the whole of the book of Genesis, Shem Melech, the name of a king. This is the minimum over the whole of the book of Genesis. Shem Melech. But when I saw the next one, the next slide, that sent a shiver down my spine. Now, if I am going to take this text of 36, I am now going to divide it by four and take that very same text. You'll have now nine letters a line. Are you with me? Nine fours of 36. Meaning that if we're going to read now again vertically, France will now appear at every fourth line. It's got to remain the same 36 letters. But since we're now reducing the lines to nine letters a line, this is, in fact, what appears. Here you have the text. Again, Vayomer paro el Yosef, emor el achecha zot asu. We've just now reduced that text to nine letters. Nine letters a line. It's the same text, it's the same Yosef, and it's the same Franz. Except now, because it is 36 letters a jump, you have to have four lines per, per letter. Are you all with me? Now look what happens over here. This is the minimum of this word. It's a minimum over the whole of the book of Genesis. Melech Ostri, an Austrian king, appears as a minimum over the whole of the book of Genesis. Now, it's, we're not talking about a word with three letters a word, an aharon, four letters. What you're seeing over here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine letters, eight jumps. A minimum over the whole of the book of Genesis appears this word, an Austrian king. Just where the minimum of uh, Franz Josef appears. But what do you get also over here? You get a minimum of another word. Be'ir, now Be'ir is part of the text, since we're reading it horizontally. Vina appears here as a minimum over the whole of the book of Genesis. Vienna is the Hebrew word for Vina. Vina is the Hebrew as accepted by the encyclopedia as being the word describing Vienna. So you have over here Franz, Yosef, Be'ir, Vina, Melech, Ostri. All minimums zeroing in onto one particular part of that text. Then appeared this word. Well, we have to know what, which Franz Josef. There might have been many Francis Josef. So what was his family name? Anybody know? Hmm? Habsburg. Vayomer paro el Josef, emor el achecha. Same text. Are you all with me? At a jump of 582 letters, through the letter Samach of this word Yosef, may Habsburg, the Habsburg family, that was his dynasty, appears through that letter, through that text, through that line. And now we find somebody else appearing together with our good friend Franz Josef. <coughs> All these are minimums over the whole of the book of Bereshis. Vayomer paro el Yosef. Pharaoh spoke to Joseph. Back to the same text. 
You remember that France appeared at every 36th letter. It was reduced only for your sake, in other words, for people to have to see it. It was reduced from 36 to 33. So in fact, now he'll be slightly slanted. But it's the same text. And you have the word Yosef, France. But then you find two words which are minimums over the whole of the book of Genesis. The word Yerushalayim, and a very interesting name of a person. The name is Oyabach. The minimum of the name Oyabach appears over here. So you wonder, is there any link? Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's read the top line. Franz Josef visited Jerusalem about 117 years ago. The Jewish leader who received the visitor with the old traditional blessing was Harav Meir Oyabach. All appearing in this text. They are all minimums zeroed in onto one text. This is just one example of information of how concepts which are linked either historically or we'll soon see medically or for whatever reason, seem as a minimum to have a link with one another and surround one another uh, within particular texts of the term. Um, I always like showing this one. I don't think uh, Doron brings, uh, shows it in his book. He was very limited in space over there. Every word over here you find it's very interesting. Again, a historical concept, something to do with the Jewish people, appears, all of this appears as a minimum in the whole of the book of Genesis. What you see over there at the top is a skip of 81 letters, and I think you've got the whole text over there. And you know what it's all about? Another historical figure. Remember what we said beforehand? If this is true, and as Rabbi Weissmann seems to show that there is a running code right through the Torah, then it means that the whole of history is there. You could look almost for anything. At least history. Well, I'll answer, I know what questions you're going to ask me at the end anyway. Um, but let's have a look at a historical event. Thomas Masaryk. He was the president of Czechoslovakia. Let's have a look at some information. All in one text. It's just one slide or one text. Every word over here is an absolute minimum. In fact, you will find it's not only a minimum. In fact, some of the words appear in the whole of the book of Genesis once. Okay, here we have Thomas, equidistant jump, Masarik, Nasi, president, Prague, Yuchtar will be installed or crowned. Yuchtar. Yud Kislev. The date. Yud Kislev was the date that Thomas Masaryk was installed as the president of Czechoslovakia in Prague. This Peyresh Gimel appears once in the whole of the book of Genesis. You won't find it again. Now, all this information is over a series of 81 letters. There are about 30 lines. 2,400 letters. You have about over there. What percentage is that of 78,000 letters? Pretty minimal. That is your text. This is all the information. A shot in the dark. You look for one word. You look for the minimum. You find it. You look for the other word. You look for the minimum. You put it there. You look for it and find it. And suddenly, all those words zero in onto one section. Right, here we have six examples of one topic, which are going to be... I'm going to, have to start going from one to six. We start at the beginning, and we work all our way through. Six had everything prepared beforehand, and obviously I went wrong. Here we are. A 
over here we have one, two, and then three, three, four. Lovely. Over here we have another historical event. The historical event that you're looking at is the French Revolution. The Hebrew word for a revolution is a ma'apecha. Lafoch. A turnaround. Ma'apecha is a revolution. Hatzor Fatit is the French Revolution. Here, Hatzor Fatit. Ladies and gentlemen, look at the jump. The jump is 2,103 letters, of which I can only show you about 40 letters on that line over there, 40, 50 letters. You might be asking yourself a question, just one minute. 2,000, how many jumps have we here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. In other words, you're covering over 12,000 letters just to produce the word Hatzor Fatit. I'll explain to you later on how it works and how to explain. If you call this, if you call this type of spread of letters, if you can call this um, uh, two words being linked together closely, well, I think they have, and we'll show it later on in another example. The French Revolution we have over here. This is a minimum over the whole of the book of Genesis. Now, just remember where you see the word mahapecha. Now, just notice the word mahapecha is not a jump across lines. It is, in fact, within one line. Therefore, the jump is only three, six, seven, eight letters. It's the ninth letter. So there's your text, mahapecha. Now, let's start thinking about concepts linked with the French Revolution. We'll have a history lesson tonight. So we have over here, mahapecha. You remember we had a jump over here of... We had a jump of 2,103. We are now going to reduce that 203 by 3. It'll be, due, it'll be reduced to 701 letters. The same Mahapecha, since we've reduced it by 3, the word Hatzor Fatit will now appear on every third line. Same text, just reduced. Appears as a minimum over the whole of Book of Genesis. I mean, it couldn't appear more minimum because there's only one letter in between it. Otherwise, it would be the word itself. Is the name Louis. Louis appears in the line of a jump of one letter. Now, to know which Louis we're talking about, we have a problem. It could be Joe Louis. It could be Louis Armstrong. So we have to know how can we find a way of describing our good friend Louis over here. What family did he come from? Well, we know that Franz Josef was from Habsburg. We've learned some history this evening. Can we... The house, the house of... That's it. Bourbon. So here we have the text. The very same Louis which you saw just before, only it's turned aside now. It's now on the other side. You find over here the word Louis, the very same Louis you saw on that text. And at a jump of 75 letters, you find the word Mehabayit Bourbon, from the house of Bourbon. Three letters away from the word Louis. Minimum over the whole of the book of operations. You remember the word Mahapecha, a jump of nine letters, the original, the original um, slide? Well, here we have it. Again, the word Mahapecha. Here we are. Mahapecha. And at a jump of 1,700 letters, 768 letters, we have the word Bastilia. The destruction of the Bastille. Again, showing tremendous uh, closeness to the word Mahapecha, as we will explain later on. So you have the Bastille, Mahapecha. Ladies and gentlemen, where would you expect? We all know that the Bastille was a famous fortress. Where in the book of Genesis would you expect to see the word Bastille? Hmm? Come on. Where do we mention in the book of 
Genesis a prison for political prisoners? Hmm? Yosef. You remember we had over there a jump of 1,700 something letters reduced by whatever reduction it has to be just to show you the text. Here it is. That's the very same word, the very same text but reduced down to 253 letters. Bastilia goes right through these words. Beit Hasohar, a prison, Makom, a place, Asher Asurei HaMelech, the king's prisoners, Asurim, are held in prison. The story of Yosef. Going right through that text, you'll see the story over there of Yosef. Right. I always laugh when I see this word, but it's there. And it has its, its significance is shown over here by its proximity, by the proximity of one word with the other. Without any orchestral backing, we all know what bam ba bam 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 appears in the text. Mahapecha, it's the same word as we had before, and we find the word hamasales appears in the text at a jump of 171 letters, no more than that, with tremendous close proximity to the word Ma'apecha. There's even more information, but I'd like to go on to something else right now. By the way, it's a very interesting one. I've never shown this one before, but I think for you this evening I'll show it to you. Extremely interesting. Two words... Two words which appear as a minimum over the whole of the book of Horatius at a jump of 239 letters. They've cut out, obviously, the central point of what you can see, like everything. It's extremely interesting. You find over here two words. Just look at the proximity. The two words end up over here. This is the beginning of this word. This is the end. This is the beginning of the other word. Two scientific, two scientific names which I don't think anybody had heard of more than maybe 60, 70, 80 years ago. The word proton and neutron appear in the Torah at a minimum jump. The two minimums have landed right next to one another. They are no less than about 100 letters between one another out of 78,064. It seems, obviously, you're going to ask me this question. Rabbi, one second, in what language does the Torah talk here? French? English? Latin? What language are we talking over here? This is Hebrew words, and what language? Well, obviously, if we understand that there is obviously some message over here, then obviously it's being coded in the language that we speak. Everybody knows of this basic Jewish concept that we talk about, Dibra Torah Belashon Bnei Adam. The Torah speaks in the language of human beings. We cannot talk in, we cannot understand, communicate in any other language. And if, if man has decided to call these two parts of the nucleus of, uh, an at, of the nucleus of an atom, man has decided to call it neutron and proton, if we understand that there is divine providence in every act of the human being, and therefore it was decided in heaven it will be called that, then that will be the word that will appear over here. But that we'll talk about later on. So we have now some scientific evidence over here. We'll soon see. Where do we find... Interesting. Where do we find for the first time in the Torah, in, I would say again, the book of Genesis, any mention of illness, sickness... Somehow we don't find it anywhere in the Torah. We find it once. As we come towards the end, yes? Uh, no, it doesn't say Yitzchok was ill. Yaakov, what does it say? Hinei avicha chole. It's the first time we see, and in fact there's a very famous medrash that says that Yaakov prayed to God that a person should become ill before he passes away. In fact, before then, according to our tradition, man died 
man's de uh, the, de the uh, departure of his soul from his body by, was the, by the act of a sneeze, according to our tradition. But Yaakov changed things. He asked that illness should bring about the end of life of man, so that he should be able to prepare himself for his death, etc. He shouldn't become sudden, not knowing what would, uh, not knowing, and suddenly he, a person dies suddenly. Anyway, we won't go into the philosophy of it. But funnily enough, we're going to find that in that very same area, at the end of the book of Genesis in Vayachi, where it says, Ahine avicha chole, we find all these words appearing as minimums over the whole of the book of Genesis. This word, ma-cha-lot, illnesses. Minimum. The minimum of the word virusim, viruses, appears in this text. <coughs> you will find that the word virus, which is certainly a modern word, does have its Hebrew equivalent. We know that the word of a, 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 a disease, a machala, and a virus is a negev, a negev, like a plague, what we call. And the very same place where you just saw the word machalot, illnesses, you'll find the word negifim. Negifim is the Hebrew word for virus. The very same place that you find the word virus and the word machalot, you're going to find this word. Here it is again, your word machalot, in close proximity, you're going to find this word, chai dakim, bacteria, and in fact you'll find another interesting thing, the name of an illness, and the person, oh one second, no, four, we have over here, the word bacteria, here is the word chaydakim, and right next to the word chaydakim you'll find the word cholera. The word cholera appears at a jump of three letters, which couldn't be more minimum than that. Interestingly enough, very few people seem to know who is the person who actually isolated the, chol the cholera bacteria. Any, any doctors among us this evening? Ah, Dr. Seville, yes? Do you know? Oh, well, no, we won't test you tonight. <laughs> You're on holiday. Anyway, we'll learn some medicine this evening. Right next to the word cholera, here it is, ha cholera, you will find that Robert Koch was the German bacteriologist and physician who discovered it. He right, I said it, and the name Koch appears right over here at the jump of one letter. I mean, it couldn't be less than that because then you've got the word. I don't think he was yet merited that his name should be mentioned in the tone as a word, but at least he's coded there. Koch appears right next to the word cholera at a distance of four letters out of 78,000. So over here you see the proximity of these letters and appearing over here. Now, we'll take one more illness. I know there's another one which everybody wants to hear about, which we'll talk about later on. But this one over here, number one. It is a very unfortunate illness that unfortunately many people suffer from, and that is the, the, uh, the disease called diabetes. Now diabetes is called in Hebrew, diabetes is obviously caused by the, uh, the, uh, the problem of uh, digesting sugar. Uh, sugar in Hebrew is called sukkah. And uh, the disease is called sakeret, sukaret. So in other words, it's sugar diabetes. Now the name sakeret appears as a minimum over the whole of the book of Bereshis. It appears over here at a jump of only five letters. Yet interestingly enough, right across it, it is not a minimum over the whole of the book of Genesis. It is a minimum over 98% of the book. Okay, I think that should be good enough for us this evening. Interestingly enough, appears right next to the Chov, one letter away from it, the word Shem Machala, the name of a disease. Now, we have to know what is the cause of that disease. What is the cause of that disease? We know that there's a, pers there's a particular organ in man which fails to uh, function. And if we're not, I'm not mistaken, its English name is called pancreas. Okay, 
So we'll see if the Torah talks English, because this is a language which we understand. And we find over here that just by the word sakeret, here it is, the same sakeret, five letters, one line above it, there it is, that's what you call proximity, you find the word meha pancreas, it comes from the pancreas, appears right next to the word sakeret. With the same appearance of sakeret, you have the word pancreas. But there is a Hebrew word for that organ in the human body. Um, and there's a particular, I think, a reason why it's called that. I don't know whether you know. You know, you know that when we buy, uh, when we buy the aravos, when we buy aravot for the lulav and esrig, we try and buy the ones with a very fresh growing leaf coming out of the top. A long, and what do we call that word? We call it lavluv. That is the fresh new leaves coming out, and they're not torn or brown or anything like that, and that really shows how beautiful this alava is to be used. Now, interestingly enough, the pancreas also looks very elongated, pear-shaped, and looks very, and that is why the Hebrew word for love, for the pancreas is called lav-lav. Now, where would you find the word lav-lav in the book of Genesis as a word? Well, you won't, but you will. Because if we're reading the Torah as one stream of letters, then we're going to join up two words together. And it appears once in the whole of the book of Genesis. Vayignov Yaakov and Jacob stole et lev lavan, the heart of Laban. Lev lavan, with leaving out the last nun as a stream of letters, you have lamed bed, lamed bed, which is lav lav. And ladies and gentlemen, look what appeared over here. Here it is. Sakeret, lav lav, vayignov Yaakov et lev lavan ha'arami. But the word lav lav as a word appears there. And right next to the word sakeret, the minimum over the whole of the book of Genesis, appears the word insulin. Right across the book. over the whole of the book of Bereshus. <laughs> now, <laughs> I want to show you before I go on to coming towards the, the real, the, the experiments to find out exactly what's going on over here with all these codes, I have over here a historical event which is, takes up nine, I have to take up nine, uh, sorry. Nine of these. Now, what's happening over here in this historical event? It's again a historical event which affects the, it affected the world, it affected our people, everybody. Are words which you will see flowing from one transparency to the next. We're going to show how words are interlinked with one another as we go along. And this is just to show you this evening, without talking any of all the statistics, just to show you a direction, and you can come to your own conclusions about what's going on. I'll tell you later on exactly what four world's top mathematicians have said about the work that is being done by these two gentlemen. Right. Number one. Let's look at a historical event. And we'll only know about it as we go along, as we go right through the, uh, these uh, uh, transparencies. All the words you find over here, except the word rigul, you will find over here three words. The word rigul, mismachim, yishlachu. Rigul means espionage. Mismachim are documents. Yishlachu will be sent. 
The number that you see at the top over there, 1,496 divided by 3, means that that number of this word, we have reduced it by 3 in order for you to be able to see it. These two words are minimums over the whole of the book of Bereshis. This is a minimum over half the book of Bereshis, and still has very important significance. We're talking about an event of espionage, documents having been sent. We'll see who, what, and what had happened. Remember, the last word we used was mismachim, documents. We're going to use that word again over here. I'm sorry for you, those people at the back, you won't see a thing. Almost I can't see it. Um, but I'll read it to you as uh, well, pointing these words to you. Again, the word mismachim is 1496 divided by 4, not by 3. And you find the word mismachim read over here. This is a text. It's exactly the same text. The interesting words that you are going to see over here is mismachim, a document. And the minimum for the word tzva'im appears right through the word at a distance of one letter from the other across one line, and that is the word military documents. Minimum over the whole of the book of Bereshis. Now, let's have a look at these words. Miyad, the minimum of two words. Miyad, immediately, Osruhu, he was arrested. Who was arrested? Haneesham, the minimum of the accused. Yehudi, as a word, appears over here. Now, all these are words which are minimums over the whole of Book of Bereshit. We're talking about documents, army documents, military documents, immediate arrest, the accused, Yehudi. And let's find out who the person was, which is obvious to all of you. You will find that the minimum of this name appears over here. The minimum over the word Dreyfus appearing over here, the minimum over the whole of, of Bereshis, appears right next to the word Haneesham the accused, which we've just taken up from the last slide. So we're just closing in one word on top of the other as we go through these transparencies. So we find over here the word Dreyfus Haneesham. Number four, we'll find out what happened. Again, here we have our good friend Dreyfus, who we had beforehand, the minimum over the whole of book of Genesis of the word mishpat, the minimum of the whole world of the, of the word hapsak, the verdict, the minimum of the word asruhu, under arrest, all appears in this text right around the word the dalad of the name Dreyfus. Let's go further with this. This is, one, this is absolutely beautiful. It's unbelievable. I mean, we all know the Dreyfus affair. But somebody doesn't, unless I read the story, uh, and I had to read uh, Shearer's book uh, on, the, uh, on the rise and fall of the French Republic just to find out who was the one, who was the person that made sure that because Dreyfus was a Jew, he would be the one who would be charged. And he would, it was a conspiracy to charge Dreyfus for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the act of espionage which he didn't commit. Interestingly enough, the man's name was Major Robert Henri. That was his name. He was of French intelligence. Major Robert Henri. Any Israelis here who can tell us what is a major uh, in Hebrew? Well, the word is Raf Seren. Well, over here, Raf Seren is a minimum over the whole of Book of Bereshis. The word Henri is right next to him at a jump of one letter. 
appears as a minimum. Interestingly enough, looking at the text where it appears, these are the words. You remember who was accused of spying in the Torah? Yosef accused his brothers. Right next to the posuk. Who ashe dibalti alechem lemo maraglimatem? Yes, it's true, you are a spy. You are spies. Over here, ha'elil, the conspiracy. By who? Rafserim Ari. Appears as a minimum of the whole of Book of Genesis. We're not finished yet. Before he was sent off to Devil's Island, he was humiliated. His decorations were removed from him. Okay? You remember our basic word over here was the word Hanesham, the accused. That was the word we had before. We find that the word over here, Dar Gyotav, his decorations, Nit Lashu, a minimum over the whole of Sefer Bereshis, one letter. Over here it's a jump of 3,000 letters divided by seven. There's a one letter difference between the word accused and his decorations. There is one letter difference between over here, Nit Lashu, his, um, his decorations were torn off from him. That was number six. We come to number seven. Okay, he was sent to prison. I just, we won't have time to see all of them. We have over here him being sent to prison, the word Asir, as a prisoner. And now we find an interesting case. One man tried to find, to prove his innocence. The man's name was Emil Zola. Emil Zola's name was looked for in the computer in the whole of the book of Genesis. He appeared once. So in other words, he's not only the minimum, he's a maximum. It just appeared once, it didn't appear more than that. It appears over here, Emil, sorry, Emil Zola. Interestingly enough, his approach was straight away to the President of the French Republic. And the minimum of the word Hanasi and Le Nazi appears on one line, right close to the name Emil Zola. Now we all know that Emil Zola wrote a famous, a famous uh, article in the newspaper, and we all know what it was called. Correct? Well, those of you who don't know, you will see over here the name Dreyfus. This is our original Dreyfus that we had beforehand. And we find the words, and it looks a little bit mixed up, but let's read it properly. Aleph Nun Yud, with a jump of one letter, is Ani, I. Mem, Aleph, Shin, Yud, Mem, the same line, Ma'ashim, I accuse. Which accuse was his famous article that he accused the French Republic of a conspiracy. Right next to the name Dreyfus. Now, the interesting thing over here was this that he wrote it, and that very same place where before we saw the single appearance of Emil Zola, Emil Zola, over there, where this was the single appearance, minimum and maximum, because it only appears once, his name, Anima Ashim, which you saw on the previous transparency, goes right through his name in the very same text. But what hit me hard was the last one of all of them. And that was this. Let me take you back, just before I show you the last one, I'd like to take you back which obviously I can't find anymore. Here he is. That's it. I have a reason for this. <clears throat> there are 9,000 Yud... I'm sorry, did I say that the Vov was the most... Yes. The Vov was 8,000. There are 9,000 Yuds 
in the book of Genesis. There are 9,000 Jews, which is 11% of the number of letters in the book of Genesis. Just have a look over here. On the very words of Ani Ma'ashim, the same thing that you saw before, Ani, jump letter, Ma'ashim, is the minimum and the only appearance of one word. In other words, again, it appeared once, that's the minimum and the maximum of the name Esterhazy. Does that name mean anything to anybody? No, it doesn't seem to. <laughs> Count von Esterhazy was the spy. He was a German and he sold, he sold secrets to the Germans because he had to pay his wife's doctor's fees because his wife was dying from a funny disease. And uh, it pushed him to get money from the Germans and he sold, he sold the, uh, the documents to the Germans and, he, and uh, Dreyfus was accused for that crime. Interestingly enough, on the very same Yud of Ani Ma'ashim out of the 9,000 Yuds, the very same Yud appears the name Esterhazy over here. Now, there are many more examples. I have over here examples of, the, uh, um, of an event which took place, a very interesting one, and that is the uh, assassination of Sadat. All the information you wanted, even before the event, you could have found it here. And you would never have known that it could have happened, but, uh, so you won't go into it. But what I do want to, at this stage, make a short, not a short break, but to explain to you which direction these people are working. And not only to watch how they're working, to show how these people, even as scientists, they are working objectively. If you think they're just taking the book of Genesis and finding these things out, and the wonderful, successful <coughs> results they're showing you, and all their failures they're not showing you, and therefore they think they have something and they can pull the wool over our eyes, well, we're not gullible. We also know that people like to show successes and don't want to show failures. I just want to show you a chart. Now this I took from the actual paper that they had written on this topic. They did a very objective test. We know that the life, that the date of birth, the date of birth and the date of death of a person has some significance with the person himself. They took the names of Gdole Israel, who I said each and every one of them received at least more. I'm sorry, here we are. More or less three columns objectively in, a, in the encyclopedia. Here you have names the Orachaim. You have over here the Orachaim, Sefer HaChasidim. Uh, the Ramo, the Ramchal, Rambam, Chacham Tzvi, Rashi, Mahal Shal. These are all names of anybody who's ever heard of these. are names of our great sages uh, right through the last 2,000 years. They took the names of these people whose birth, date, birth day dates and death dates are known to us. And they wanted to know if there was any link between one and the other. They took 34 names. But these 34 names, they didn't just take and look in the book of Genesis. What they did was, they did, they took the book of Genesis, plus another test of the book of Genesis, when the words, the whole, all the letters of the book of Genesis were jumbled up randomly. They describe it as being randomly on a, what machine was it? Or some computer machine, it was mixed up randomly. In other words, absolutely uh, uh, random mix-up of all the letters. They did that test on the book of Boratius, as we have it. They did the very same test on a random mix-up of Boratius. They did the very same test on the, uh, the, the Bible of the Samaritans. Again, the very same test. They did a very same test on the book of Genesis when a thousand letters were removed. Random letters, those random letters were not random, they actually decided for some reason or other, no reason at all actually, to take out the first thousand mapic hays. You know what a mapic hay is? A hay with a dagish. They took those out and will do an experiment where 
This is the book of Genesis. This is the book of Genesis mixed up. And this is a random set of essays by a Professor Rosenberg who all his essays together added up to something like 78,000 letters. So in fact, they just took a random secular text. And look what happened. When they did the one test of taking the names and the birthdays and seeing whether they are linked to one another, as we will see one example, I'll just show you one. When they took all the 34 names, the final results in the book of Genesis was reduced to zero. In fact, if you really want to know what the answers were, we will find that they was, that it was, the random chance was 1.3 to 10 to the minus 9. That was the chances that the probabilities of the, uh, of it being random. 10 to the minus 9 is 1 with 9 noughts, which is 100 million. Yet, when they took the book of Genesis randomly jumbled up, you will notice over here, no reduction to anywhere. In fact, you have a pure average. And in fact, this is what was expected to see. The same thing happened with Professor Rosenberg. We get such a picture. Yet, when Professor Diaconis asked them, take another 34 names and do the same thing, experiment, but this time I want the experiment to be a little bit different. The experiment was this. I want you to take the book of Genesis. I want you to check the names in Genesis with their birth dates and death dates. Also in the book of Genesis, but leave out the word rabbi. Leave out the word rabbi. Well, we know that most of our gedolim, most of our gedolim have, uh, have names which not necessarily have the word rabbi. Uh, the Or Hachaim doesn't have the word rabbi. So the word rabbi was omitted. The third test was to do this. X person, but X plus first date. You know what they did? 34 names. They had name of person number one with the birth and death date of person number two. Person number two with the birth and death date of person number three. So in other words, this is what you call permuted data. They went down by one stage, not his own birth date and death date, but the birth and death date of the next person in line on experiment. And look what happened. Nothing. All this, whether it was with rabbi or without rabbi, reduced to zero. Whether it was without rabbi, reduced to zero. What was the answer? Just look at the bottom line of this paper, that this was a result of their work. The first set of data gave us a result of 10 point minus 9. They were scared that with Professor Diaconis' experiment, this was from Harvard University, that they will demand something more and that will change the whole picture that they had produced on the first 34. The second example produced 1.2 to 10 to the minus 9. And when they took it all together, the results of all the experiments showed that the probability, ladies and gentlemen, that all these names and I'll just show you one, one example. Just one example. In a second. The answer was, as you read over there, the answer was, in the end, 1.8 to 10 to the minus 17 noughts. Meaning, roughly, you have over here the chances that all the information you have seen this evening, plus the names, the chances that this is random chance was worked out to be 1, 1, 17 noughts. What does it mean? Well, during the seminar, we were using texts this size. 
It's about a half a centimetre thick, about 25 centimetres long, about 20 centimetres wide. We were using these texts during that seminar. He worked out the thickness, the volume of them. And he worked out that if you needed, what, if you needed 10 to the minus 17 texts, to, for this picture, as you see it today, appear again once, you will need a warehouse full of these texts, and that warehouse will have to be this size. One million miles long, two miles wide, and 600,000 meters high. Now, if you have a warehouse that big, full of such random texts, this all will appear once more. That is the meaning of 10 to the minus 17 to a layman. I mean, the decision every person comes to his own, every person comes to his own conclusion of how the results are. Let me just show you one or two examples of what he meant by birth and death dates. And here we have a very famous one. And obviously this is a lovely, I love showing this one only in South Africa. Because since 99% of everybody over here is a Lithuanian Jew, as myself, we will show you the Gaona Vilna. The Gaona Vilna appears in the Torah over here. Interestingly enough, it's, it's really it's mind-boggling that his name appears at an equidistant jump in one verse, or in one line at least, in one line. Over here, now I had to colour them in because you shouldn't get all jumbled up. The circular orange colours is the word Hagaon. Ha, Ga, Aleph, Vav, Nun. Hagaon. Me, next to the letter Ha is a Mem. Go back seven letters, Mi, Vilna. Hagaon, Mi, Vilna appears in one line. And interestingly enough, over here, Look how close he is from this word. Chav. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Betet Vav Nisan. He was born on the 15th of Nisan. Pretty close. This is what you call proximity. The next one is... Two. Now, again, if you want to know what objectivity is, this, this. What is, uh, how do you tell a date? You can say a date as being the 15th of Nisan. You could say it is on the 15th of Nisan, which is B. And sometimes you can have a problem over here, and that is 15 in, when we write down the number 15, we usually write it as Tet Vav, 9, 6, 15. Why? Because we don't want to have to write Yud and a Hay, which makes up 15, and that Yud and the Hay is also part of the name of Hashem. So that we don't do that. But how do we know that the Torah doesn't write it that way? So they even tried the word yud Hey of Nisan. He was born on the 15th of Nisan. So here we have, here's the same Gaon Mi Vilna. Ber on yud Hey Nisan goes right through his name. Minimum over the whole of the book of Genesis. This is all the minimums. Not just it does appear there. It is the minimum. After that we have his death date. And the date of his death was Yud Tet Tishrei, the 19th of Tishrei. Minimum over the whole of the book of Genesis. Here it is, Gaon Mi Vilna, Yud Tet Tishrei. That was the day he died. Again, proximity to his name. And all this was tested, again, on Genesis, Genesis random, the word rabbi taken out, the Samaritan Torah, everything. Wherever it appeared anywhere else, it was not where it should be, and only in the book of Genesis did it appear where it should be. Interestingly enough, we will find... Ah. A very interesting... Phenomena, and that is where the word Hagaoni Vilna appears over here, where his death date appears over there, you will find one of his monumental works, Aderet Eliyahu, Aderet Eliyahu, 
also appears in the text in close proximity to his name. This was just one example of the names I wanted to, to show you. I want to, uh, I want to end, as I said, I will mention to you the, uh, this, uh, which I know many people wanted to see, and that was uh, this uh, problem that we are suffering with in our day and age. And that was this illness. In fact, extremely uh, interesting because, again, of, this, uh, of the, as the information it shows over here. Here we have it, this illness of AIDS. Right. Over here we have the appearance of the word AIDS. And, in fact, it appears twice. It appears once during the flood, when Hashem says, Emche et ha'adam, I will wipe out man because of the decadence he had lowered himself to. I don't have to dot my I's and cross my T's when I see the link between one and the other. The second time we will meet AIDS is in Sodom. That is the second time we will meet the, uh, the minimum. And over here, you will find over here, very interestingly enough, the word AIDS as a minimum. And the only single appearance of the word monkeys, the single appearance of the whole, in other words, minimum and maximum, because it only appears once, Meha Kofim, and we know that it comes from monkeys originally, appears over here, right next to the word AIDS. And right across it, it says the word Badam. It's in the blood. Next to it is the word Mavet, which is death. Now, all these are minimums over the book of Genesis. The second part is this one. And this is, to me, another example. You remember I said to you before that the, the Samach... <coughs> let me show this one too. Oh, yes, of course. Over here, we'll show, as I'll show it to you soon over here, 220 letters... I'm going to show you now some words. Now, it would be very unusual to find uh, a word with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 letters. There is no Hebrew word with 13 letters. But what we have over here is three words, or four words, as we will soon explain. We have three words that have the same jump because they just continue one after the other. Now, what are the chances, I mean, we, we once spoke about this, that if you're looking for a word, if let's say I had, uh, my name is David, David, I looked for my word David in the Torah, which is obviously you'll find thousands of times because it's only three letters and they're very common letters, Dalad, Vov, Dalad. But we know that basically, if I find a Dalad, what are the chances I'll find a Vov after that? The chances are 1 in 22, because there are 22 letters, something's got to turn up, so maybe the Vov will turn up, so it's 1 in 22. It would be less because the Vov is very frequent. But after that Vov, to find a Dalad is again 1 in 22 squared. And if your name, if you were looking like the name Esterhazy, Aleph, Samach, Tes, Resh, Hay, Zayn, Yud, the chances that it should appear at all are pretty minimal. But you know, when you come to a chance of 1 in 22 to the power of 6 or 7, do you know what 22 to the power of 6 is? It's a phenomenal number. We're running in millions. Now, if we were going to look over here for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 1, in, one to 22 to the power of 12 is a number which will run from one end of the room to the other. Yes, it does appear. And just look what does appear. We find over here the word bidmut. Now, bidmut means in the appearance, it appears. Virus, as a virus, that very same samach, which, uh, which, uh, which makes up the word virus, makes up the word AIDS, coming backwards. So you have bidmut, it appears as a virus, AIDS, ayom, it's a terrible disease. But interestingly enough, the word bidmut is made up itself of two words, which would be very closely linked with the with the AIDS virus. The dam in the blood, mavit, it causes death. So you could have here 
בדם, מוות, וירוס, איידס, exactly the same number, running straight after the other. And this in itself is extremely significant, statistically speaking. But look what appears over here. That very same text, which we now took down, which we now showed you as AIDS, bit moves, reduced now, obviously reduced uh, by, I don't know how much, uh, reduced by four, just to show you the text. Ber, dam, mavet, you remember how many samachs we told you that there are in the Torah? There are only 400 of them, 400 and something. We said it is five tenths of one percent. And look what these samachs are going to do to us this evening. Bidmut, virus, that samach is the same samach for the word virus. It is the same samach for the word AIDS. And look what happens over here. First of all, the name of the virus appears as a string of letters. H-I-V, hey Yudva, appears right next to the name AIDS. Plus the fact that another Samach is going to play a part of two words. ha chisun, the immunosystem, harus, is destroyed. All appearing now from this Samach. Now that we're using two Samachs for four words, the chances that Samachs should appear there at all are pretty slim. There are only five-tenths of one percent chance that they should be there. Yet, they do play such a part, they fill up this whole system, and all of them appear at a minimum. These are all minimums over the whole of the book of Genesis. So you have your immuno system, blood, death, terrible, what else? AIDS, virus, appearance, HIV2. Heyudva is the name given to, the, gave it, given to this virus. This is just one other example. The one I like to end with is just one example. And that's this. If I was looking over the whole of the book of Genesis, just trying to find it, I think yes. There are many more examples. I have over here, I could, I don't like to, with such a large audience, such a wonderful audience start talking about uh, events of the Holocaust as they appear over here with such tremendous detail. But uh, I'd like to end with uh, just this one example. Can you imagine, first of all, before I do that, I promised you I would explain what will happen when you have a very wide uh, jump between letters. Now, I'm going to have to explain it literally in layman's language, so that we can all understand. I told you before, let's say, you remember the word pancreas appeared at a jump of 2,000 letters between each letter. Now, there are eight jumps, or seven jumps, between each letter. Now, if you take seven and, divide, and multiply it by 2,700, that's almost three, You've almost got over there uh, 21,000 letters between the first and the last letter. 21,000 letters is almost a quarter of the book of Genesis. Yet you found it very close to the word sugar, sakeret. So somebody's going to ask me this question and say, just one second, you've just come over here, 21,000 letters. Do you call that proximity? I mean, it's a quarter of the book. But now let me explain to you in true layman's language, how, what they mean by proximity. You will remember that we saw the word pancreas diagonally and the word sakeret somewhere like that. That was the picture we saw. Now, you saw on this slide 30 letters. If we were now going to make at 3,000 letters a line, we're going to write the book of Genesis. There are 78,000 letters at 3,000 letters a line. 3,078,000, we will need something in the region of 25 lines. With 25 lines, you can write the whole book of Genesis at 3,000 letters a line. Now, the slides that we have in front of here are roughly 20 centimeters long. 
and I can yet usually get about 30 to 40 letters on them. How long would this slide have to be if I wanted it to be 3,000 letters long? About 20 metres. In other words, it would be about the length of this hall. Okay? So I make a parchment, or a transparency, the length of this hall, 20 letters long, wide, 3,000 letters long. I am now going to have a piece of part, a, pe a slide, roughly that long, which is roughly 20 meters. And where are we going to find succulent and pancreas? On the 20 meter long sheet. We're going to find it somewhere over here. That's where it will appear. Now that's what I mean by proximity. You see, we forget, we imagine that because there is a long spread, you will not see it because it's spread over such a long line. But, in fact, it isn't. There is, over here, 2,000 letters long, and you are now going to have to go 27... You're going to have to go 20... Um, you're going to have to have 20 metres long transparency in order to write it the way the word pancreas should appear. Then it would appear something like this. And, in fact, this is very, very, very close together, one another over such a long, such a long uh, transparency. This is the way we explain it in layman's language, without going into the mathematics of it. But, there is one word which appears here at a jump of 10,000 letters. And it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven jumps. And the jump is 10,000 letters, and it only appears once in the whole of the book of Genesis. Now, if you're going to say that there are seven jumps... 10,000 letters, in fact what you're telling me is the word begins at the beginning of Voracious and it ends at the end of Voracious. Why? Because you've almost covered the 76,000 letters. Seven tens are 70,000. You've covered over 70,000 letters. And since the jump over here is 10,624, in fact, it does begin almost at the very beginning of Genesis and ends at the very end. And it appears only once. It's a very interesting one and that's this. The word Torat Hashem, Yudkei Vavkei, cuts right across the whole of the book of Genesis at a maximum jump of, minimum jump of 10,624 letters. In other words, we're seeing over here a beautiful jump. And what does this word say? The Torah of Hashem. We have over here, ladies and gentlemen, an area, I mean, I could carry on reading till, till literally to 3 o'clock in the morning. I just haven't even gone through 10, 15% of what there is to show. Of an area where today, let me tell you what scientists have been saying about the information. Professor Fürstenberg of the Hebrew University, Jerusalem wrote a letter together with Professor Fyatatsky Shapira of the University of Tel Aviv and Yale University in the United States, Professor Kashdan of Harvard University and Professor Bernstein of Harvard University. They have said this research is extremely serious, done by very serious researchers. That's part of a letter. I'd like to read out to you what... Professor Goodhart, Gerald Goodhart of the University School of, the Univers the Lond of London University, on a discussion of the paper by Professor Bartholomew at the Royal, at the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society, and here you have a page showing over here the Aharon text. They had to do it in very English because it's not for Jews; it was for it's for the scientific community. And on the Aharon text alone which we saw this evening, he writes these words. This is beginning to look significant. But significant of what? Example after example of these so-called hidden codes are being revealed and subjected to statistical analysis. The Hebrew text has been carefully preserved in what is its present form at least since the time of the Masoretes around a thousand years ago. If these patterns do not occur by chance, it is difficult to conceive of the human mind capable of inserting them to remain hidden for so long. 
This is a scientific paper in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society of England. In other words, I think that these gentlemen in Israel who have been doing a wonderful job in trying to show how history unfolds itself over here, and many more examples, the, uh, in all its detail, and how it all zeroes in onto one text, and the text has meaning, such as we just now have seen, Teras Hashem, cutting right across. In fact, this is all in a book. In fact, what I'm saying to you, if you could all read easy Hebrew, it's not easy, it's a bit technical Hebrew, a book that has come out by Dr. Vidstone called Hameimat HaNasaf. I believe you can get it over here. Some people do have it. I hope it's coming out in English in the near future. We certainly, ladies and gentlemen, have a tremendous message. I want you to know that these people, they're working, they're not working over there to get papers, scientific papers, and get a lot of, uh, got a lot of pats, pats on their backs and honorary doctorates and things like that. They're working on this topic for one reason, one reason alone. L'shem Shemai. They're doing it for the sake and the honor of heaven. I think they have over here a dimension, a new dimension, a rational dimension, a scientific dimension, one which appeals to people's logic into understanding. The Torah could not have been written by human beings. As Professor, as uh, Dr. Gerald Goodhart, Professor Gerald Goodhart writes in, the, uh, in this journal, himself, not a non-Jew, is beginning to question what is there over here? We see, of course, over here, the whole of history unfolds itself in Sefer Bereshis, because that is what our rabbis have taught us. That is why Sefer Bereshis was given, according, says the Gaon of Vilna, that the whole of history unfolds itself there. And in order to be able for us to be able to see this wonderful concept and to be able to come close to this, this idea, this philosophical idea, which is so basic in Jewish philosophy, because otherwise Judaism has no meaning. And that is to see Torah min Hashemayim, that the Torah was divinely revealed. A Torah which transcends time and space, because it transcends the human mind. It transcends the human mind and only enters into actually the mind of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, given to human, given to us to be able to keep. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hope that this evening, to me, it always, when, even when I talk about it, although I've spoken about it many times, it gives me a chizuk, let I hope it gives everybody a chizuk, in understanding the, the, wonderful, the wonderful Torah that we have and, what, and how we should be somer with our Torah and keep our Torah and, 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 uh, and understand it and study Torah. So let us hope that now we're coming to Rosh Hashanah, a new year, let us hope that this has given us all a little bit more strength to understand the Torah we have given, this Torah in Hashemayim, and let us hope we will all have a Ksiva Vachsima Torah, a very happy and a prosperous new year. And let us be. Let us hope that this coming year, even before this coming year, let us be zochet to the bias girl tzedek, the coming of the Mashiach. Be here, be Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before you leave, I just have your attention for a few minutes. First of all, I'd like to thank, very sincerely, on behalf of everybody, Rabbi Ordman. Um, there's just, while sitting there, three things went through my mind. Uh, mom, the Chazal say, Hafach ba, Hafach ba, de Kula ba. But if you turn the Torah over and over, there's everything that's there. And that, I think, was evident. The idea was there. Also, it says that it's a Torah's emiss. That if the information, the future and the past lie in the Torah, there's a Torah's emiss. It means that the actual te text itself is emiss. And the last idea that went through my mind was... Chazal say clearly in Kohelis that the closer we come to Mashiach, the time of Mashiach, it will be a time she'en bo It will be a time where the freedom of choice will be literally taken away from a person. And in, the, in that time, Chazal say that Gerim, that one will not accept converts anymore because the truth will be so clear that everybody will, will want to accept the Torah upon himself. Um, I just want to say in conclusion that the, it is very strange and it's unfortunate in a way that Rabbi Ordman has been um, associated purely with this material. We had the privilege of him spending a Shabbos with us in the Yo Street Shul. It was a fascinating Shabbos. We didn't speak about any of this information at all. It was it just uh, it was for Shurim on Torah subject. It was fascinating. And therefore, um, I want to invite everybody, 
He's only speaking uh, once more to, uh, to the public, and that will be in Or Sameach, uh, Northfield Avenue. I'm sure everybody knows where that is. And he'll be speaking on a different subject. That will be Rosh Hashanah, a time for a heart transplant. Um, with that, I thank everybody. If anybody would like to, remind, uh, to remain over, I know it's late, but those people that are interested, uh, we will have a, a question uh, uh, time, and, any, in the, and at the same time, anybody please... To